as Max mentioned, I basically lead our APAC work around content regulation. Um, recently moved here from Brussels, so I have been working in Brussels for the last 11 years prior to coming to Singapore. So my point of reference is pretty much very much around the European Union. Um, and did a lot of work around like the code of practices that existed there as well as um, uh, working through the, the recent consultation on the Digital Services Act. So really look forward to working with you and your team and everyone else. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Really happy to make your acquaintance. <laughs> and I know Minister is super busy at the moment because of the COVID situation and uh, Taiwan is developing a lot of tech solutions to that, to that issue. Uh, so we will keep our conversation within like 30 minutes to 35 minutes. Uh, and uh, um, at the moment, uh, when, when, when Simon and Audrey, when you're talking, uh, George and I and Meg will mute ourselves. But uh, feel free to uh, ping us or just talk to us. Uh, we can turn on uh, the video. Uh, otherwise, we'll be uh, Simon and Audrey you talking. Um, and uh, so about 9.30, 930 uh, 9.35 or 9.40 that we will probably start to wrap up, uh, so keep the conversation within like 30 minutes. So with for, without further ado, I will pass it to Simon and for you to kick off. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Tang. It's great to see you. Uh, it's been you know, an eventful six months uh, since we were on the APEC uh, panel together. Uh, in November uh, last year, it's a pleasure to be with you again. I only wish it was in, uh, you know, we were actually in person. And uh, frankly, also that the situation was rather better in both uh, Singapore and Taiwan, uh, so that uh, we won't, uh, uh, you know, continue to be focused on the the, the uh, issues of public health uh, uh, that, that you know, I know I know is occupying a lot of your time. And um, I, I know we we are going to talk a bit about regulation today, but. Uh, be very happy to, if you'd like as well just to talk a little bit about the the, the COVID situation and and the support that we we have provided um, uh, in partnership uh, with the uh, Taiwanese government but if there are other things that are on your mind that if you'd like to share around that and uh, where we might also be able to be of help I'd, I'd love to hear that. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I remember uh, your active uh, collaboration uh, leading up to our presidential election and MP election uh, in order to have honest advertisements as published in real time uh, as a API for investigative journalists. Uh, that really helped a lot uh, to combat the infodemic. Uh, well, we, we didn't call it infodemic back then, but yeah, the, the infodemic uh, and enhance, if not public health, public mental health. Uh, so thank you for the collaboration. Uh, you're welcome. Um, look, I, I can I, I know from experience of Singapore where we were feeling very where it very much felt things were under control. Uh, we everything was returning to normal. Uh, we were somewhat behind uh, Taiwan in that respect, but uh, I know that you're going through you know, some difficult difficult times uh, right now with this uh, with these spikes uh, and also issues around. Um, you know, vaccine uh, kind of take up, uh, etc. So uh, again, this is something that we're very active on uh, across uh, Asia uh, as well as elsewhere in the world, and in, in working with uh, national health authorities to address misinformation, to ensure people have good information uh, about uh, vaccines and other public health matters, and also to you know help people uh, find vaccines, etc. So again, if there are some things that uh, come during this conversation or in subsequent days where you think perhaps there's something you're aware of that we're doing elsewhere that might be helpful in Taiwan and then you know, please let us know or if your teams could let us know about that. Okay, excellent. Yeah, uh, I am uh, currently uh, working, as Max has mentioned, on the vaccine appointment uh, system. Uh, we're looking at, well, not a spike now, right? Uh, rather kind of flattened curve, uh, but it's not going down. So uh, just a continuously flattened curve. Um, and uh, on the other hand, of course, that means that the vaccination is on top of everyone's mind. Uh, back when I was vaccinated on the first dose in mid-April, uh, I, I had a very difficult time convincing my friends and family to get vaccinated. Uh, well, we don't have that problem now. Uh, so I think the fair distribution and appointment uh, is, um, is the only thing uh, that's um, 
currently uh, blocking us uh, from achieving significant vaccine uptake, uh, that and of course the supply of vaccines. Um, and so um, I, I wonder how Facebook have worked uh, previously with other vaccine appointment uh, systems, either in the US or in other countries. Do you have um, like stories, anecdotes, or some working models to share? Well, actually, as you may have seen just yesterday, uh, we launched a partnership with the Hong Kong government on what's called Vaccine Finder. So what we could have to do after this call is just share some information with you about that. And if you, that seems like something that would be of interest um, that, and that could be helpful, uh, then, uh, but also we can, uh, we can, you know, Max can provide information about other partnerships we've done on the vaccine front. Uh, and you can see whether some of those might, uh, one, or, one or more of those might be helpful for time right why don't we do that after the call? Excellent, thank you. Okay, no problem. Are you okay then to just go on and talk about the issue of regulation? Yes. Uh, which is the uh, primary purpose for our call. Uh, I mean, look, it, it's um, uh, when Mark Zuckerberg, uh, probably uh, no, more than two years ago now, said, look, we are in favor of regulation. We think it's, uh, it is, um, uh, it, it's, it's not right for uh, these big private companies to be making big decisions uh, every day around where to draw the line on um, content online. And, and actually, we do think this is a, uh, an important role for governments here. Um, frankly, the first, I would say almost 18 months after he made that uh, you know, um, declaration, really not that much happened. Uh, there was a lot of talk, but not a lot of action. But what we've really seen in the last six to nine months is a lot more action. And now it's actually countries which are not looking to regulate the internet are, are seem to be in a minority. Um, uh, and what we're seeing is just a, a, a real, um, a, a, a very you know, big range of different actions. Obviously with Meg on the call, we have an expert of what's happening in Europe. Uh, and she, I'm sure, will be happy to um, join our conversation if you've got some specific questions about that. But we've also developed our thinking, particularly around what are, you know, when we talk about regulating, it's not just any kind of regulation, clearly. Uh, we, we definitely think there are some regulations which are frankly you know, bad, uh, are actually going to suppress freedom of expression or are going to impose the wrong kind of obligations on uh, platforms like ourselves, which will uh, not enable the kind of openness uh, that you know, we appreciate about the internet and not allow for connectivity and the sharing of ideas. Uh, around around the world, and, and frankly, also disrupt some of the fundamentals of of how the internet works. But what we want, of course, want to do is work with um, governments that are keen on trying to find a balance between um, how we enable freedom of expression, how we get the balance right between what are what should be the obligations of of platforms uh, and what are the obligations of people uh, using uh, services like Facebook or Instagram and, and our, our messenger services. And so I'm happy to talk a bit more about some of those principles, but I'd love to just understand where you're thinking is at and, the, and you're thinking of fellow ministers around um, you know, the future for um, uh, content regulation in, in Taiwan. Certainly. <clears throat> so. Um... Because of our rather successful, I would say, collaboration around honest advertisement, which we treat as de facto election campaign sponsored campaign uh, expenditure, right? That was the, the uh, framework. So uh, we did not uh, pass a election amendment act to regulate uh, political and social cause um, speech uh, on Facebook during our presidential election season. Uh, and I believe that success, well, qualified, but relative success, uh, led uh, to more action around, say, our leading antivirus companies like Trend Micro uh, now starts to offer counter disinformation services in uh, addition to the counter scam and counter virus, uh, counter phishing services. Uh, a startup called uh, Husko, I believe, uh, also joined uh, this work. Uh, in addition to, of course, the Taiwan Fact Check Center and Michael Pen, who you already understand, uh, have a partnership with Facebook. So uh, what we're looking at is what I call a um, people public private partnership where people, the social sector, take the lead to establish speech-related norms uh, and uh, Facebook uh, as an um, economic sector player basically adhere to such rules according to, say, uh, the initiative about self-regulation on disinformation that you uh, have already signed uh, in addition to uh, PTT and other players. And the government, instead of 
passing any particular act, uh, simply publish uh, how much um, the norm is followed and abided uh, by the economic sector players. Uh, so that was the uh, model that we worked rather successfully leading up to the presidential election. And that's my, of course, preferred approach if things do work. Uh, Minister Lo Bing Chen also said uh, that if this model works, then of course the uh, legislator doesn't have to do a top-down approach that you just uh, alluded to. Uh, and um, so my interest is in keeping this um, people-public-private partnership model uh, work in the emerging challenges uh, around non-election related speech. Uh, well, referendum, of course, <laughs> is coming, uh, but there's many other things. Yes. Well, that, that I mean, the, the flexibility, uh, as well as the kind of multi-party, a multilateral approach to that, uh, is something that we are very supportive of, um, because you know, we're, you know, we've we've all seen examples, and I guess the European cookie law is probably one of those prominent examples of regulations which, however well-meaning, because they are structured in a very technical, technological specific way actually become rather self-defeating uh, and just become an annoying feature of, of, of life on, online and don't actually help people necessarily understand uh, issues around privacy um, uh, and, and tracking and that kind of thing. So uh, we're certainly in favor of uh, flexibility, incentives for accountability, uh, I think is very important. So these issues around transparency and so this, uh, you know, the, the way in which the government um, you know, effectively, almost from the sound of it, under under your preferred model, would effectively audit or, or, or require companies to report on how are they doing against these kind of codes that are coming out of uh, public-private uh, dialogue. Uh, seem, you know, absolutely, we, we've seen that work very well uh, in the European context around misinformation um, and, the, and the codes there and the, you know, the, the transparency around that. So that all sounds like a very positive uh, an area that we could be supportive of and indeed we can share uh, with you and Minister uh, Lowe as well our, our experience of, of this in, in different parts of the world. I mean, are there particular uh, countries or regions that you're with Minister Lowe looking at to see what can we learn from those? Well, um, I, I don't know whether the Oversight Board is a jurisdiction, uh, but actually we do look at your Oversight Board uh, to to discover uh, the ways of how to make the, it more transparent, accountable, um, if not directly participatory. I mean, there's no jury <laughs> in Oversight Board jurisdiction. Uh, but uh, I, I think the Oversight Board um, is quite transparent uh, in its decisions and its workflow. Um, the, the only issue that we found from the social sector's uh, observations in Taiwan is that the, the throughput, uh, that is to say the timeliness, uh, really needs work. Uh, that is to say, uh, when the result um, of an oversight board decision affects the algorithm or the parameters, exactly how that's implemented and uh, how soon it's implemented, implemented in what fashion, uh, people don't really have a way to, to see that. Uh, and of course, the, the in, inbound flow into the oversight board, how the cases are selected and, and so on. Uh, these, of course, uh, remains um, non-participatory. Um, so in, instead of uh, pointing to another jurisdiction, uh, which you know may change by passing a new law overnight, uh, I would like to, to uh, explain explore how your uh, preferred ideal world oversight board, the both the inbound flow and the outbound algorithmic uh, processes and uh, accountability and transparency would work uh, in your ideal world. I mean, what we've not yet seen is examples of how the oversight boards work interacts with or will interact, uh, or certainly not, sorry, interacts with different um, kind of regulatory arrangements in mm -hmm. certain countries. Mm -hmm. We've always said the Oversight Board is not about um, how we respond to national laws mm -hmm. around speech. Um, so as you know, we've got um, you know, pretty well established processes now for um, taking in reports from governments where they believe there is speech on our platform, which mm -hmm. is locally unlawful. Um, for us to review that and uh, under the, the, uh, the Global Network Initiative uh, framework, uh, and then uh, in, in certain circumstances to geoblock uh, content. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we do have a mechanism of doing that, but the Oversight Board is very separate. It's all about our standards mm -hmm. and providing a, a oversight around how we apply our community standards and also where we draw the line. And mm -hmm. obviously we've had the most recent example of that where 
Um, uh, the oversight board has, you know, said, look, you, you, some of your approaches towards suspending people are seem rather arbitrary, and you need to provide certainty. Uh, and that was obviously in particular in respect of uh, President Trump, and, and you'll have seen uh, hopefully our announcement around that last week. But also in our new in our transparency centre, we also now, as a result of the oversight board's. Uh, um, uh, decisions, we now provide more more transparency around the nature of our strike system uh, and what you know, what are the sanctions we apply when people contravene our, our terms and in particular the approach we take for very for people with a more prominent voice like a president or an ex-president. So um, I mean and, and as you know we also have a, a an oversight board member uh, from Taiwan, Dr. Catherine Chen. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no idea whether she was involved in her involvement in that decision, um, because these things are, um, you know, the oversight board doesn't say who, who's on what, what panels, as it were. But uh, I, I'm sure we can share with you more, you and colleagues, more information about our early experience of working with the oversight board, mm -hmm. and uh, and we perhaps could share some thoughts about how that mm -hmm. could link to what uh, happens within uh, individual uh, mm -hmm. administrations. You know. Mm -hmm. different, different mm -hmm. governments. Yeah, so a clarifying question. Uh, I take that when you said these are separate processes, uh, you mean that a national uh, geoblock or takedown is not subject to an oversight board appeal. Right. Right, but, but I was more alluding the, the other way, like a uh, right. Facebook content policy takedown, whether it's mm -hmm. subject to a, a national government appeal for the oversight board uh, to, to relook. Uh, yes, it could be. I mean, for instance, uh, I mean, if, if there is a piece of content where we have acted uh, on it and it involves that government, uh, then uh, they could appeal uh, that. that. Um, I mean, tip, but we, 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 as I understand, I, I, I could, we can dig out the details on this, but we're primarily focused on if you have had a piece of content removed by Facebook and Drift Community Standards, you can appeal to the Oversight Board. Um, as I understand it, we don't allow third parties to appeal on behalf of us. Even for national governments. Uh -huh. yes. uh -huh. okay. yeah. Even for national governments. So we, uh, you know, we, at the moment, we've generally thought of these things as, I mean, they're clearly all part of an accountability framework. I'm all part of us saying we don't think it's right that um, you know, a private American multinational should be making all these decisions in a what can feel like an unaccountable way, even if we're quite public about the decisions we make, and that that was why we call for regulation, but also why we've uh, why we've um, you know, developed the oversight board. And and you're right, when it came to appointing the members, there wasn't a big public vote about that, but now the oversight board appoints its own members. So whereas Facebook was, you know, had a process for the original appointments, now the oversight board is, has its own independent approach to how it uh, replenishes its membership and um, and also it, it is independent in the cases that it takes on, um, both ones that Facebook asks it to take on, but also ones which are appealed by uh, by users of, of the of the service. Okay, um, I, I bring this up, uh, and, and you will see that I'm trying to get content reposted rather than taken down. Uh, it, it's because uh, we've witnessed that um, the fact checkers serve an important role as a contextualizing service. But if it's taken down by Facebook's machine learning, bot detection, or whatever other means, then actually the fact checkers or other communities do not have any means to provide that contextualizing service. And sometimes when applied incorrectly, the machine learning based takedowns uh, does not actually have a good appeal process uh, for individual users. And so in that moment, if um, the national government or any other consumer protection authority do not step in, then it actually provides a, a very good um, conspiracy theory for that. <laughs> that is to say, uh, it actually amplifies the polarization around this uh, random arbitrary look like uh, take down with no appeal process, uh, if you understand what I'm saying, because this is not a individual to individual basis, but rather a, a large uh, net of related accounts misclassified uh, as takedown potentials by machine learning. And currently, as Consumer Protection Authority or as um, the national government, we actually have no visibility uh, into this. And, and so even when people uh, have, can provide evidence to fact checkers that they were being wrongfully taken down, <clears throat> we'll have to ask them to individually take to the oversight board, but the inbound flow is um, 
not managed now. Uh, it's not very transparent. Uh, and so that creates a kind of legitimacy uh, pressure on both Facebook uh, and the consumer protection authorities. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good point, and it's one of the reasons why we don't kind of um, we haven't uh, just transferred all responsibility over to the oversight board. Part of the reason for having a, a large public policy team, and obviously we have Max Chen for uh, for Taiwan, and, and obviously George is uh, in, in charge of the the wider region. Um, is that you know they are also there for if there are issues like this, which are almost more where you where there's a concern to be maybe more systemic, or that we're getting some there's a, there's a, there's a there's something, there's something going on here uh, in terms of our machine learning or in terms of how we're interacting with our third party fact checkers, then absolutely you, you and colleagues are hopefully bringing those uh, to our attention uh, mm -hmm. so that we can look into those separately from the mm -hmm. oversight board. So we're not saying mm -hmm. that, as it were, the oversight board is the only place you can go mm -hmm. uh, if you think that Facebook's getting uh, something wrong here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are other channels, um, both for government, I mean, to, you know, both for governments and for our trusted partners and for our third party fact checkers. There are, there are many routes in uh, to Facebook, uh, but and I would hope that you in particular and your fellow mm -hmm. ministers uh, would always be you know, willing to, you know, you know, would be very quick to let us know if you think there's something that's, uh, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's not, not getting right. But generally as well with our third party fact checkers, we are not taking content down. Mm -hmm. uh, when they let us know that they think it, something is likely false, we label it. Uh, we reduce its distribution, um, but it's still available on Facebook. The, the exceptional areas are ones where we think there may be a link to real world harm. And actually, this is particularly with respect to COVID, where we, we do um, certain types of COVID misinformation we actually remove from Facebook. Uh, rather than just apply the label because we're really concerned about um, you know, misinformation leading to people either taking you know quack kind of remedies, you know whether that's drinking bleach or something or some other kind of uh, remedy or um, it, it leading to uh, people um, you know not taking you know vaccines which have been kind of widely approved for for use uh, because of misinformation suggesting that are helpful. Yeah, um, but so, sorry to uh, kind of drill down this point. Uh, in Taiwan, we, we've we, yeah we, we've had, uh, for example, uh, a disinformation uh, that said that the uh, uh, Taipei and New Taipei cities uh, will receive uh, quote unquote. Um, chemical um, army sprays uh, to kill the virus uh, and it's very toxic and things like that. Uh, and of course it's uh, debunked almost immediately by the Taiwan Fact Check Center. But I think, I, I presume, uh, and from what we witness, that's the kind of messages uh, that you actually go to take down instead of going to uh, notice in public notice. But, but what's, the, what's the mechanism to make such decisions? So, uh, I mean, we can, I, I'm, I'm happy uh, via Max to provide more information after the call to explain how that works and to provide some examples. Uh, what we've done, I'm, I'm not sure, and mm -hmm. Max may be able to chime in if there are some I, I mean, it's obviously COVID-based, so uh, it's according to your criteria, it's entirely uh, possible um, for Facebook to just classify it as a takedown rather than a public notice. Uh, and in these, case, right, in these cases, uh, we actually, uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, provided a concrete proposal via Max to you, uh, that is to say a um, second party uh, notice and public geo notice, uh, and and I, I believe that proposal was uh, seriously considered, but ultimately not implemented. Uh, Max probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Max, yeah, I can I can provide some uh, insight into that. So when we're talking about misinformation and harm, we're talking about harms on individuals, on personal like harms. Um, we we. Usually, when there's no call to action to harm a person, then we probably won't uh, take action on those contents, but we rely on third party fact checkers. Of course, that is a policy evolving, and we have seen some involvement, uh, evol evolution in, in surrounding that policy uh, in the COVID, uh, COVID time. Um, and the, uh, about your uh, points on the labeling, uh, actually, we are uh, doing that. So when you are posting contents about, about vaccines, for example, in any language, you'll have a, a label on that so that you can uh, take a look at the uh, COVID Info Center uh, on our platform to find more information about vaccines. So actually, uh, 
the outreach to misinformation remains the, pretty much the same, that removes, reduce, and inform, uh, which we believe that informing, uh, uh, informing our audiences and make sure that people have informed decision is the better cure to the misinformation issue. So uh, hope, uh, definitely I can provide more examples and uh, give you a follow-up uh, mm -hmm. conversation with, with your team. Yeah, uh, but, yeah. but that's not geo-labeling. That's, uh, that's uh, universal labeling. Right. Well, I, I'm, what I'm talking about is a very specific proposal. Instead of universal labeling, like uh, any vaccine-related information in any languages receive a universal labeling that redirects to the vaccine center, I'm talking about a very specific proposal, which is um, when a national government or competent authority notice something that warrants labeling, they have a way into Facebook to mandate within the geo uh, region, uh, such a um, government competent authority provided label uh, on that class of information, on that class of shared posts. That is to say, we don't call it fact checking because we are not journalists, incompetent authorities. Uh, we totally understand that. But we also uh, believe that there is a way to uh, get the messages into the informed people. Uh, and uh, when we first talk about this proposal, I think Max's point uh, was that the competent authorities were not trained uh, in um, getting the right messages out in labeling or things like that, uh, using the uh, Central Election Commission as an example. But I believe the situation have changed now and they are informed to provide pretty good labeling messages. Well, actually, we do have an example of this uh, in our region, and that's in Singapore, uh, where there is this uh, false news law called POFMA, uh, which does result in effectively geo labeling. Um, now, um, well, uh, as I understand it, uh, from you know, from Max and from George, this is something that the Taiwanese government looked at when uh, the Singapore government introduced that, and and you decided that wasn't the right way uh, to go in terms of regulating for this. Um, uh, but uh, you know, very happy to have a kind of some follow up dialogue of this and just to share with you our experience of uh, of POFMA um, and and to think about is there is there something else here. That, mm -hmm. uh, could, could be helpful when there are situations like uh, that. Uh, my original proposal was not a, a law to enact POFMA. What I'm looking at is a protocol similar to the self-regulation protocol that Facebook have signed around political and social advertisement. That is to say, uh, it is also designed to be multi-party when we made that proposal uh, without resorting to a law, which would be something like POFMA. Uh, but uh, I, I mean, um, if the you know, protocol level, uh, the rough consensus level, uh, which is more flexible and more fair and more uh, easy for uh, civil society to get involved, uh, doesn't work out, then of course uh, we are continuously looking at POFMA uh, in the legislature chamber, but because I'm in the administration, so I'm more interested uh, in a non-POFMA uh, non act uh, way to introduce an a, um, auditable, accountable form of geolabeling. Um, but if you think uh, a law is required to do that, then of course the MPs will have to no, consider that. <laughs> yeah. I think actually one thing we should do is share with you our experience of the COVID information hub, mm -hmm. which is when, when people are either looking for information about COVID mm -hmm. or... They are, you they, know, they uh, particularly maybe are, um, you know, something that they might be looking at a something which is being debunked. Then we will often we will tip in direct them to the COVID information centre, mm -hmm. and that is obviously providing official information, either from WHO, or I'm sure from in Taiwan's case from the local, uh, from, from from the National Health Authority, um, and so you know, so there there are ways in which we ensure that people get locally relevant information about COVID mm -hmm. um, uh, when, whenever they are kind of in contact with uh, uh, information about COVID generally on Facebook, as well as sometimes we will do things where everybody, irrespective of whether they've been looking at COVID-related information, will get a notice about, hey, here's the latest information on you know, who's eligible for vaccines in, in, in your, uh, where you live. So there are a number of different ways we do this. Um, and and you know, we can share with you a kind of comprehensive digest of that and some of our experience around the world of what's really worked. Because I certainly wasn't suggesting uh, that you should uh, go down the same route as pop, but there's all kinds of issues uh, that come out of that. Um, but it, it is the closest example I've seen of mm -hmm. specific geo-labeling on specific pieces of content. Mm -hmm. um, but each, each time it's used, it also creates some controversy. 
Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying that the government should be the uh, only party uh, to communicate this to, to Facebook. The, the good thing about a multi-party or a multi-stakeholder protocol is that we can carve out uh, community accepted ways uh, for third party that are sometimes more trusted than governments uh, to either vet or contribute uh, to such public notices. Great. Well, I'm, I'm very conscious of your time, and I know you're very busy. Sure. But I just want to reiterate that as your thinking develops, we, we very much welcome being part of different forums that you might bring together, particularly uh, forums with the public, and to talk about how can we um, address these understandable concerns that people have about both the uh, how we support freedom of expression, but also how we help people have the best possible experience as citizens uh, online. Um, so I, I hope we can continue this really fruitful dialogue and you're always um, very constructively challenging uh, about our approach to things, which uh, I really appreciate. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we're therefore able to wrap up. Is that right, Max? Are you going to bring things to a conclusion? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to get to the conclusion. I think that uh, uh, we, we haven't really concluded the conversation, and definitely I will continue to follow up with your team. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of action items that we, we, we take note of, and uh, uh, I'll definitely follow up with Francis. Uh, for the, this meeting, uh, if George and Meg can turn on the video, and we can have a quick uh, snap, uh, quick shot of the, uh, the meeting so that uh, you can cut the record of it. And uh, okay, great. Thank you very much. So now smile. Hey, George, you're okay. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, so I smile. I've got something to pride as well. I feel bad now. <laughs> uh, I should have thought about that. Well done. Uh, well done, Audrey. Francis, are you going just to just take Francis? Me, you want me to join? Okay, one second. Okay. I, <laughs> I like I like the fruits. Uh, let me just take, take another shot. Wow, that's wonderful. Okay, well, thank you guys, uh, and thank you, Manish Han, for your time. And I know you're super busy, and we'll follow up with the vaccine finders and other uh, like tech solutions that we provide to other markets. Um, probably will be useful for Taiwan as well. And Meg has prepared a lot of um, um, pre uh, materials for our continual work in Taiwan uh, surrounding counter regulations. We're working with NCC and with Minister Law's office. Actually, Sam is still going to have another meeting with Minister Law on the 22nd, uh, which we would believe that um, uh, we can also uh, share our top of mind uh, ideas about uh, how we, we can work with Taiwan because Taiwan is definitely unique in this region uh, uh, in that aspect. So thank you mm -hmm. again and thank you Simon mm -hmm. for making your time and this is for help on coordinating this. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you, uh, and uh, I'll post a conversation with only my side of video but with all of your voices to YouTube as I believe previously communicated. Okay, so yeah. thank you. Uh, so. Thank you uh, and look, looking forward to continued discussion. Bye. Live long and prosper. Bye.